even though we might see a situation correctly, know that God's on our side, is like, oh yeah, God's going to take that guy out. He's wrong. But we don't want God to use us to do it, right? That's somebody else's task. We can leave that to another person. No, David took it upon himself. He said, this guy is clearly defying God and somebody needs to do something about it, so I'm going to do something about it. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report this evening come from the book of 1 Samuel. And really the only thing you need to know about this, because we are continuing our series in the book of Samuel, is David is bringing food to his brothers. So Jesse, David's father, he has three sons fighting in the war against the Philistines, and he wants David to be in charge of bringing food. This was a common practice back then. You didn't have military rations the way that you do now in America and other countries as well. When you were at war, your family had to be the one that was in charge of bringing you food. Same thing was true if you were, for example, in prison. The prison didn't provide food. You had to provide food. If you had a family member in jail, you were the one in charge of feeding them. And so this is what is really happening and going on here is that David is bringing provisions to his brothers that are off fighting the Philistines in the war. And this is the episode that we see play out in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 24 through 26. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. The men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel. Talking about the Goliath here, of course. And it will be the king, it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? So, this is in stark contrast. Stark contrast to everyone's reaction that has been at this battlefield and has seen Goliath so far. And I think that the Bible does intentionally go out of its way to highlight that contrast, to point out, hey, this guy sees this situation differently than every other person that is here on the battlefield. Everybody else sees Goliath, and they're afraid. They're trembling. It points that out in multiple times in the Bible. They're trying to emphasize everybody else is scared to death of Goliath, and David looks at it, and he goes, who's this guy defying God? Where does he get off taunting us? That's David's reaction to it, which is just wildly different from everybody else, and I find that so interesting. Because here's the thing. The other Israelites, they knew that this was a defiance of God. They understood that. They understood that what was going on here is that Goliath was calling out the armies of Israel and calling out the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob specifically and basically saying, look, your God's not going to do anything. Your armies aren't going to do anything. Nobody can beat me. I am defying you and I am defying your God. They understood that, but their reaction was completely different from David's. Why? They both saw that. They both saw that this was a defiance from God, but the men of Israel they saw that, and it didn't make a big difference to them. It did to David. That's what made him so different, is that David saw this man clearly defying God and goes, oh, he just sold his own death warrant. That's how David sees the situation. And the reason is because David is looking at this through a spiritual lens. He's looking at it through God's eyes. And by the way, this is actually paralleled with the situation where he has chosen to be king. 
Because remember that Samuel is looking over David's brothers, and he's going, okay, it's got to be this guy, and God says no. And okay, it's got to be this one, and God says no. And we actually went over that just a, a few chaplains' reports ago. The reason for that is that God was looking not at their physical appearance, not looking at it from a worldly perspective. He was looking at the heart. He was looking at the spirit and the spiritual condition of these brothers. And he saw that David was the one that was most fit for this office. This is why. Because David is also looking at it from a spiritual perspective. He's seeing this situation the way that God is seeing it. Everybody else is, knows that he's defying God, but they don't see that as being a significant factor at play here. Might make them mad, but it certainly isn't enough to get them to understand, oh, he just defied the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This guy is going to be punished by God for that. That's how David sees this whole thing. He sees, he just insulted God. His days are numbered now. God is going to take a retribution on this uncircumcised Philistine for doing that. And so, it's kind of like, and it reminds me a little bit of a, a story I heard about Winston Churchill, that when they announced that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, Winston Churchill apparently, quietly, without saying a word, went to his desk, took a drink, and said, gentlemen, we've won the war. And the reason that he did is because he knew, now that the Americans are involved, this fight's over. We're done. We don't have to worry about anything else anymore because the Americans are going to come in. We are going to win this war because of this. Now, obviously, America is not God. But even more so than Winston Churchill, David now sees this fight as a sure thing. And just like Winston Churchill, who now charges into battle with, you know, a little bit more, more fire in his step, a, a little bit of swagger, that's how David's about to roll in and take on Goliath. Because it, now he knows, this man is defying God, which means God is on my side and is opposing this guy, which means I don't have anything to worry about when I fight this guy. You see, now he has seen God as being in play in this series of events. And now that God's in play, oh, this is going to be easy. This isn't going to be a big deal at all. And of course, it turns out that David was right. And I think that that's somewhat highlighted as well in this next passage that we're going to look at just a few verses later. Same chapter, 1 Samuel 17, verses 31 and 32. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So now that David perceives that God is on their side, that the, this Philistine Goliath is the enemy, he's got no chance because God is now in opposition to him. He just signed his own death warrant. David says, sure, I'll jump in that fight. Not going to break a sweat. David's confidence came from God. It didn't come from his own ability because he's just a boy. At this point, he's probably an early teenager. 13, 14, 15, something like that. And we're going to find out in a few verses, David can't even wield a sword yet. He's not been trained in battle. He's not a warrior. And despite all of this, he's convinced that he is going to destroy this guy because God is on his side. He knows that. And that's the same thing, the same attitude that we should be adopting too. Once we understand that God is on our side, that he is going to be with us in a struggle, we should be walking out there just like David went out against Goliath. We should be the first one to volunteer. Just like David does in this last verse. He says, yes, yeah, all I'm here and God is going to be with me. So I'm going to head out there. I'm going to take this guy out. So it's not just that David saw the situation correctly. It's also that he reacted correctly. Because even though we might see a situation correctly, know that God's on our side is like, Oh yeah, God's going to take that guy out. He's wrong. But we don't want God to use us to do it, right? That's somebody else's task. We can leave that to another person. No, David took it upon himself. He said, this guy is clearly defying God. And somebody needs to do something about it, so I'm going to do something about it. 
He didn't even ask any else to take it up. Without another word, he's just like, yep, I I'm your guy. I will be the one that rides into this battle. You see, everybody else saw the crowd. All the Israelites are looking around at their fellow Israelites and seeing how scared everybody is, and, and that's contagious. They think that they need to be scared too, and they trembled. David's looking around at this and going, what's wrong with you people? Why has nobody gone up against this guy? You guys are the army of the living God, and you're letting this guy push you around? I'm not going to do that. You see, David went the opposite way of what the crowd was doing, and that shows the mantle of a leader. This is the story that introduces David's personality, because we've seen him be anointed so far. We've seen God say that he's a good person, but we've not actually seen it play out in any meaningful way. This is a highlight of that. This is showing that David is ready and willing to lead. That even when the crowd is against him, he is going to step out there and do what he knows is right because it's the right thing to do. Sadly, that's the opposite of Saul. We've seen in this narrative so far, time after time after time, Saul's primary concern is what the crowd is doing, and he has shown that he will go along with the crowd rather than obey God. I mean, Saul is a lot like a lot of modern politicians. He's going to do whatever preserves his power. David has no power, at least not at this point, and says, I'm going to do the right thing regardless. doesn't matter to him. He is going to make sure that he is on God's side, because ultimately, this is a spiritual battle for David. David understands this is a spiritual conflict, and I think that at least part of it was David wanted to encourage Israel. The way that he uses his language here, the way that he talks about it, it seems as though he's trying to inspire courage in others while this is going on, he's saying, look at this guy. This uncircumcised Philistine is going to be the one defying God? Oh, no, no. This needs to be taken care of, and I'm going to be the one to do it. And I got to believe that there were quite a, bit of, uh, quite a few Israelites that were inspired even before he took on Goliath, just by his words. Maybe not enough to volunteer, but that courage had to be contagious, and this is the reason that David became such a fantastic leader. You see, sometimes it's going to fall to us. Sometimes we're going to see a need. We're going to recognize a need that needs to be fulfilled and nobody is fulfilling it. And because of that, the responsibility, the odious, will fall upon us to take up that mantle and to do the right thing. That is going to happen in our lives if we are going to be followers of God. Now, it may not be in a very obvious way the way David is doing it, but everybody is going to have to take the spiritual lead at some point, even if you wind up going it alone. David may have inspired quite a few people, but he still had to face Goliath by himself. Or at least with no other Israelite helping him there. He wasn't alone. But ultimately, we may have to do that too. And when we do, I hope that each and every one of us would have the courage that David did. Stay the course, friends. A recent survey showed that the average American spends, I kid you not, eight seconds reading a news story before either commenting on it or sharing it. That means that most people are barely finishing the headline before spouting out an opinion on content they didn't actually watch or read. Therefore, if you are watching this and made it to the end of this video, congratulations. You are, as Bernie Sanders would say, the 1%. So now it's totally appropriate to like and subscribe.